Good morning and uh, welcome uh, to another session in ECLIT. Uh, my name is Mario Ramirez. I'm a clinical microbiologist with the Lisbon School of Medicine in Lisbon, Portugal. And my co-chair is uh, Professor Mauricio Sanguinetti. And without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to my co-chair to introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Marian Koopman. Thank you, Mario. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce this keynote lecture from uh, Professor Marion Kopmans. Marion is head of the Department of Bioscience at the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam. He's a great expert in this field and uh, will speak about the modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 evidence and guts, a very important topic. Thank you, Marion, and please. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction and for the invitation uh, to uh, discuss this important topic. So uh, when we ask uh, ourselves, what do we know about SARS-CoV transmission modes? Uh, that actually is quite a complex picture. We know it, uh, it involves people, uh, an infected host, a recipient. We know it involves uh, uh, droplets, uh, aerosol transmission. We know it may involve fomites, but uh, there is a lot of factors to consider for a deeper understanding. The first category of factors, of course, relates to infection biology. What are the kinetics of shedding? When are people most infectious? How does that relate to their symptoms uh, and their, their, their general health? Uh, the same applies, of course, at the, at the side of the recipient. Uh, but the category of issues to consider is also behavior. Where are you? What type of uh, contacts uh, have occurred? Um, because that determines a lot of transmission. There is something to consider, um, while not a major factor, but we do see that uh, there may be reverse zoonotic transmission of the virus into pets, uh, cats particularly, uh, but also farm animals. And then, of course, we have the virus to consider, and particularly with an uh, increasingly diversifying virus, we have to keep uh, 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 being aware about possible changes to the transmissibility of it. So there are some things that we are pretty sure about. There is, uh, it's clear that SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-2 replicates in the upper and lower respiratory tract and uh, that has been also demonstrated uh, in, in animal models uh, in related to transmissibility. Shedding peaks uh, really around symptom onset, but may start a, slide a few days before that, and high levels of virus, viral load are seen early on. Um, infection can be in asymptomatic uh, or very mild in majority of people and SARS-2 is spread through droplets, stable for prolonged periods of time in droplets and in experimental settings in aerosols and on surfaces. Now, but uh, this is also an area that I'm sure all of you have, have gotten numerous questions about. Uh, there's these three topics that I would like to discuss. What is the role of children in transmission? What do we know? What do we not know? What is this discussion about the relative contribution of droplets versus aerosols in different settings? And uh, is the virus mutating to a milder variant? Where do, where do we stand with this? Let's start with the children. So there is things again we know. Children, uh, if you look at notifications uh, globally, are a, uh, a small fraction of reported disease uh, cases. Um, one to two percent, for instance, in our region, where 20 percent uh, is uh, under 19 years of age, so underrepresented. When children are infected, the evidence so far uh, suggests that the viral loads are similar uh, to those seen in adults, although there are um, studies that, that, uh, that, that uh, show variable results. Zero surveys so far suggest there are, uh, children are less commonly infected and household studies suggest that children are less commonly index cases and transmit less often. And I will go over some of that work. 
So here is, of course, uh, it's important to realize that with all the literature out there, there's not that many really well-defined uh, cohort studies that are uh, powered sufficiently. But here's a great example from the UK, which has uh, uh, built a large national cohort of, with 260 hospitals. And this is an analysis of the 651 children hospitalized during the first half year of this pandemic there. And what they see is interesting. Respiratory syndrome that you expect that we have come to, to, uh, to understand. But there is also uh, a second syndrome, which is clinical presentation, which is more of an enteric uh, syndrome. Uh, particularly in children to uh, consider. Now that matches observations here in organized that uh, anthrocytes can be uh, infected with uh, SARS-2 as well. If you then look at what is the further evidence for uh, uh, fecal shedding uh, and prevalence of GI symptoms, uh, in, in patients with coronavirus disease. Here's data from a meta-analysis, and uh, mind you, I still think this is wild. This is a meta-analysis of data from preprints. This is uh, how, how this is evolving. But studies uh, so far, they settle around 40% around of uh, people do have also a GI syndrome and uh, uh, confirmed with uh, fecal shedding, but as you can see, the estimates vary quite uh, widely. Now, um, whether fecal transmission plays a role in, uh, in, in spreading is unclear at this stage, and there's big questions around that, particularly in relation to foodborne transmission that need to be looked at. But there is also an advantage in the sense that this fecal shedding is used for surveillance. Here's an example from uh, our country with the Water Research Institute. And they have started to look at uh, sewage as a source of information um, uh, early on, uh, end of February, where they show that uh, they, they could track the virus and that, that tracking line in orange here uh, very nicely correlated with the hospitalizations that were uh, recorded in that period of time. Now, more recently, you see that, that those lines start to diverge, and that's because, of course, as everywhere, the uh, level of testing has gone up, gone up dramatically. But, but an additional advantage is if you can uh, detect the virus in sewage, you can also uh, look at the genetics. Here's a, a paper that just was put online by uh, Ray Ischiero, a PhD student with uh, Miranda de Graaf, who has tried to see if she can reconstruct uh, genomes or partial genomes from that sewage and compare that here for Dutch data with the global uh, data, just to show where that fits, but also look for specific uh, uh, mutations to see if maybe there are uh, region-specific uh, uh, lineages evolving. Uh, important tool for surveillance. But let's go back to uh, children. So here's an interesting systematic review, um, uh, still in preprint, uh, but that has done a heroic job uh, trying to go through uh, all the, the papers published and, and online, uh, asking this question, what is the evidence of children and transmission or children and susceptibility? And first conclusion here is out of 1400 papers, very few really provide data that allow you to look into this question. So lots of papers, little evidence. Now, what does the evidence show so far? Well, it seems that uh, the papers so far settle around, indeed, children seem to be less often infected. Um, the, the estimates uh, uh, differ. Uh, there are sometimes wide confidence intervals because of the low numbers. And there are there is one notable exception here. Um, but overall, the conclusion seems to be um, Yes, children tend to be less often infected. Here's also work from a that looked at transmission pairs in households. Um, that's for work from the Netherlands from this paper, um, where you can see uh, uh, 
that transmission occurs a lot within the same uh, age bracket, which is something uh, we see for, for, for quite a few diseases. And that, again, children are, are notably underrepresented. And there's an interesting uh, paper just online uh, in, in science translational medicine that has looked at immune responses in different age groups and suggests that maybe in children, there's a stronger innate immune response that could explain part of these observations. Okay, switching to the uh, second topic, uh, the relative contribution of droplets and aerosols. And this is a very challenging debate uh, is what I think. Uh, but here again, an interesting uh, attempt at trying to structure this discussion and I will talk you through it. So what this uh, publication did is again, a systematic literature review to see what do we really know? What do we know about uh, concentrations of SARS-2 in, in, in nose and throat. Um, what, uh, what do we know about the volume of aerosols um, th that is produced by different activities from breathing to speaking, uh, the droplet size distribution, the volume and the number of virus particles in that, and uh, the inhaled dose. And they use that to model uh, risk of exposure. So this is data from the literature review on the aerosol volume created if you breathe, uh, which of course you cannot stop doing, if you speak, uh, cough and sneeze. And these are the categories that we try to reduce by, by uh, asking people to stay home when sick. And what you can easily see is just that, the, the, that being symptomatic means you produce more. Uh, that's that's completely understandable. Uh, so here with the averages, there's a almost a thousandfold difference. But of course, what you can also see there's wide margins of error, and there is debate whether, for instance, you have individuals that have particular tendency to produce large volumes of aerosols. Now, what they then did is uh, use uh, combine all that data into a model that could estimate probability of exposure. And I really encourage you to take the paper because I think the line of thinking is, is uh, excellent. So what they did is uh, take that knowledge, uh, of viral loads uh, in, in people with the infection and then model what is the likelihood that you would be exposed to an infectious uh, aerosol no, no, to a, to a virus-containing aerosol, sorry, if you sit in a bus for 20 minutes. So they take into account the volume and the different activities and so on. So to, the way to read this is here you have maybe a very high uh, shedding individual. What happens if that person, you sit in a bus with that person um, and uh, he or she is speaking and you see that still the probability of exposure is very low but that differs if that same person sneezes. That's how to read it. So bottom line is um, people are more infectious when they are symptomatic uh, and even with uh, high levels of shedding, this is not immediate uh, re uh, cause for concern. Uh, and, and the current control measures really should uh, cut down on a lot of this transmission. Now, not taken into account here is the infectiousness of people. So the data so far have worked with viral loads, estimates from RNA, uh, but of course we know that uh, that does not equate the infectiousness. So this is data from a paper that looked at where in which patients with which viral loads can you still culture virus. And it's clear that infectiousness uh, decreases with duration of symptoms, but also with the uh, development of protective, uh, with uh, the development of an antibody response and particularly neutralizing antibodies. So here in this study over with people having neutralizing antibodies over a type of one in 80, uh, virus culture invariably was negative. Okay, so that's um, uh, moving on to the, the, the third question, bringing in virus diversity. So 
um, even though this as a coronavirus, this virus is not evolving very rapidly because there is some proofreading uh, mechanism that the virus is diversifying. That's obvious. Here is an image from a minimal spending tree that we produced uh, at the start of the uh, first wave in our country. Um, where essentially here you see the virus from Wuhan, but already then, early March, you could already recognize multiple uh, slightly different uh, uh, clusters of viruses. And of course, this has continued to occur with its global dispersal. Um, and with that, uh, of course, we need a way of, of structuring our thinking and, and tracking the, the diversification of this virus. So this is work done by Andrew Rambo, it's published in Nature, um, who has simply uh, made a, a, a systematic uh, attempt at, uh, at naming the different lineages that you observe and has also looked at uh, how uh, can we interpret that uh, diversification. And so far, what this mostly reflects is geographic uh, spread. So you have introduction of the virus in a certain geographic region, it starts to circulate, pick up mutations, and so you get a geographic signal. So uh, for instance, a US lineage, a European lineage, UK lineage, uh, Iranian lineage, um, what have you. Now, in addition to that, of course, there's talk of uh, specific mutations that may affect the function uh, of, of the virus. And that is, uh, of course, an important question. And here's one that is quite extensively studied. It, it's a mutation in the spike protein, which has popped up and where you really see that, that this, uh, vir the viruses with this mutation have taken over, essentially. So there's an epidemiological observation of displacement, uh, strain displacement. And that is in this paper uh, supported also by laboratory data that suggests that the level of uh, replication or that showed that the level of replication is increased uh, with the, 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 the mutant uh, in this position. Now, a cru crucial question of course is, does that have any bearing with a clinical impact? So it does seem like transmissibility has increased. It, that is reflected by the uh, now dominance uh, of this variant. Uh, but uh, clinically, there doesn't seem to be a difference. This is again work from the UK, where uh, you can see the uh, different age groups, the severity categories from no respiratory support to, to fatal. Uh, for for uh, people infected with one versus the other virus, and you you really don't do not see any consistent difference uh, in between them. So it does not uh, seem. Conclusion from this work is that uh, this mutation may affect transmissibility, but does not seem to affect uh, severity. Now, of course, this is important, and there's other. Uh, smaller variants that are under investigation because they happen at specific uh, motives and that will continue to be important uh, uh, to study their effect on, uh, on, on virulence uh, and transmissibility, but also on our ability to diagnose. Um, so PCR uh, primer fits and things like that. Um, here's a specific situation that uh, that uh, does require also scrutiny. There is more. There's going to be more presentations on this topic in this meeting. But what we are seeing is uh, uh, anthropozoonotic transmission. So the virus from people spilling back into animals. Here's a particularly sensitive animal. It seems mink, and we've seen uh, uh, re. Uh, introduction of the virus into mink farms in several countries now and in our in the Netherlands here we see ongoing transmission between mink farms. So here's a, a virus as um, uh, representing the, the diversity in humans in the region introduced in, onto farms and then moving from farm to farm and that creates its own signature because of accumulation of mutations and using that we could show that then the farm virus, the animal virus, 
uh, after passage spills back into humans. Now that's of course not something we want to be see with an evolving virus and again uh, reason to scrutinize what exactly is going on there. Then just a few minutes um, to before I end is uh, that uh, is the discussion that is starting. Can we maybe move towards smarter testing? Is it possible to increase the probability of detecting the most inf infectious individuals because we really need to be uh, on our toes to try and curb this uh, pandemic? And the background for that is that really control is extremely challenging and the track and trace capacity is under pressure, pressure, but there are now antigen detection assays coming to the market. So what is the space uh, for using them? And can we maybe move from diagnostic validation to public health testing validation? So that brings back again, the thinking about viral load distributions uh, that I showed you uh, previously but also then asking it, well, what, what do people present with? This is data from the big screening, one of the big screening stations in our country where people with very mild complaints uh, present. Uh, and now that people are familiar with this, uh, they actually come quite early and you see that the majority of people really have quite high uh, uh, viral loads when they present. Now, if you uh, then bring in antigen detection assays, um, we see th then of course it's important to understand uh, what their limit of detection is that can be done technically, but also comparing uh, what uh, levels of virus do these antigen detection tests pick up if you compare that with uh, PCR, uh, CT values or viral, viral loads. And uh, so far, um, what you see, I think there's no, not huge differences between uh, assays that are under development is that the, the, the sensitivity at the technical level, of course, is far less than PCR, but it settles around, let's say, uh, CT25 to 28 uh, values, if you uh, speak of PCR. So what does that look like if you plot that on the the distribution of uh, patients that we see uh, coming in. Um, so that means that depending on your detection limit of the antigen uh, assay, you, you miss a smaller or a bigger fraction of recent cases. But is that a problem? Because there, the, the second question is, what if you add in um, the the people, the, the fraction of people that are infectious. So that's plotting here, the data that I showed on infectiousness, where you say, well, people really need to have fairly high viral load. Um, and those are the most infectious. That would mean that by using an assay like this, you would probably detect all the infectious people and reduce the workload quite a bit because you lose these. And in this corner is also the, the low level positives where we do also see false positives. So potentially that would reduce the need for follow-up uh, depending on which assay you choose quite, quite uh, a bit. And I think it's an interesting way of uh, thinking. So uh, with that, I want to conclude um, saying that I, th I feel we all have a role to play in the uh, increasingly uh, uh, anti-science and fake news uh, type uh, landscape. So I hope to have uh, contributed a little bit with the sort of evidence synthesis as I see it uh, so far. And uh, finally, of course, I would like to acknowledge I've shown work from many of my colleagues here uh, and the funders that allow us to, uh, to do this uh, work. So thank you very much, Marion, for a very, very interesting talk, highlighting where the gaps in our knowledge are and uh, where our knowledge has evolved since the beginning of this pandemic to what we see now. So we have a number of questions. I'm not sure if we'll be able to address them all, uh, but uh, there is, there are, Perhaps uh, 
I can combine two questions into one, which is whether we should worry about fomite still, given the increasing appreciation of the role of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And I would tie that uh, with a question about whether uh, the change that we see in the behavior of uh, the spike uh, mutated virus that is spreading in Europe is actually uh, reflecting changes in the virus or reflecting changes in the behavior of the human population? Okay, um, complex questions. So, um, so, so with what we know so far, it seems like fomite transmission does not play a major role. Um, but I do think there are two specific uh, areas where that needs to be um, uh, studied. One is in settings where hygiene is problematic, for instance, in with children or in uh, uh, elderly homes with people with cognitive uh, impairment or in refugee camps. So there the situation may be different. Um, and the second is, and that's a point that the Chinese are looking into quite uh, uh, heavily, is the potential for foodborne transmission. Not thinking that's a major thing, but it could bring the virus into places where you wouldn't expect it. Um, so those are two areas that I think need further uh, scrutiny. Then uh, as far as the, the takeover of the 614 mutation, um, so uh, no, I, so I, I showed a slide where you saw that this virus is, the, this mutant is seen in all age groups. So it's not the age uh, distribution and the behavior of, of young, well, more, uh, more <laughs> outgoing, a young uh, part of the population that can explain why this uh, mutant virus really uh, emerged. That's not, so, so uh, and in uh, vitro, we do see differences. Of course, the, the proof of the pudding will be if you have a, uh, the same con a backbone and just this mutation compared and those are, studies are ongoing. Oh. We have a lot of questions for you, Marion. Uh, also, me try to combine some. Uh, what's your uh, opinion about the role of airborne transmission through aerosols, in particular in the hospital settings, and also the role of hand hygiene? Okay, so uh, aerosols, so what, what we do know is that in certain circumstances, aerosol transmission can occur. So people working in, in hospital hygiene are very familiar with that uh, and particularly with aerosol generating procedures. That's clear. Um, question is how much of that can actually happen outside the hospital environment and that's of course a big debate. So that's why I uh, showed that particular publication. If you follow that line of reasoning it says it doesn't say it's not possible, but it is not very likely. It's not going to be playing a big role. That's not to say that there can be specific circumstances where something happens. So if you have a particularly poor uh, ventilated environment with a particularly uh, infectious person, um, that, that, so th there may be that kind of a transmission, but on the whole of things, um, I don't think it plays the biggest role. Thank you. We have a, a whole lot of questions. I'm not sure we can address them all. We're reaching uh, the end of our talk. Can you in 30 seconds, 30 seconds, Marion, which is very, very short, just address the issue of super infection. Give us just a flavor for that and then we'll have to close. Super infection or super spreading? Super infection of bacteria, uh, well, Yes, we have questions on both. Also. Yeah. Well, super infection does occur. There is increasing work, I think, in ICU with, for instance, Aspergillus, uh, but uh, I ha I'm not the expert on that. Okay. And very, very last question, Marion, about the 
the importance of a CT value to determine if a patient needs isolation or not. This is very important. I appreciate yeah. a lot your presentation about antigenic tests because, yeah. of course, antigenic tests are potentially useful but have to be used carefully, carefully for sure, because we have to, to look at the patient, to look at the type of patient. And uh, so, what's your opinion about this? Yeah, about so this? that's why uh, we are also trying to do that work. Um, I think it may be possible. Um, it needs to be, of course, validated well. Um, CT values are instrument specific, setting specific, but um, but I do think it will be possible to set a CT threshold, particularly if you combine it uh, with time since illness uh, onset. So yes, I think it's possible, but needs to be carefully titrated. Okay, thank you very much, Marion. Um, we have to wrap up. Uh, we're a little over time already. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. We could uh, continue here for uh, much more time. Maurizio, my co-chair, the last thank words. You. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much Marion. to all. I, I thank you to all the attendees. Thank you Continue very much. Continue a good meeting. Continuation of a good meeting. Bye. Bye, Bye to everyone.